Okay. Welcome to the College of Complexes, everybody. Uh, my name is Don, and I'm going to be the moderator this evening. Um, our program tonight is um, our program tonight is uh, titled "Occupy and Democracy for the USA." Uh, Ted Aranda, a former member of Occupy Chicago, analyzes what happened to this group and the movement, Occupy's relationship to democracy and why he and a few other occupiers have started a new organization called Democracy for the USA. Now, uh... um, <clears throat> thanks for the College of Complexes for having me. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to give a, a bit of a, a personal history of, um, of Occupy uh, and then speak about an, an organization that we founded, Democracy for the USA. <clears throat> and I say um, a kind of a personal history because um, I'm a historian by training but I didn't go into Occupy as an as a, uh, uh, observer, as a, a disinterested observer. I went in as a participant. Um, well, as you remember, um, many of you, um, Occupy Chicago uh, started in the fall of 2011. <clears throat> it uh, followed the example of Occupy Wall Street, of course. Um, I wasn't there at the very beginning, um, and I think it's important to explain uh, why. Well, oh, can you speak louder? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, yeah. speak, I'll speak louder. It is kind of muffling. Yeah, so you might want to reconsider using the microphone. Where's the microphone? Uh, it's the over here, but it was too. Why don't you just speak louder? Okay. Okay, I'll speak louder. Yeah, okay. speak. Let him, if you want to use the microphone. Do you want to use the microphone? Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll tell you what. Let me turn yeah, the mic on. Yeah. Here you go. Okay. Um, as I was saying, um, I wasn't there at the beginning. Um, I was in the process of forming my own organization, actually. So I was pretty busy with that. Uh, I was uh, communicating with a couple of organizer buddies of mine um, from, from way back. Uh, but they ended up not really being into it, um, so that didn't really come through. Um, they didn't really share my uh, vision uh, for a radical democracy. I was going to call this organization <clears throat> Organizations for Democracy. That's pretty much what it was going to be about. Uh, I wanted to uh, transform this country from the oligarchy that it is now into a democracy. Um, so another reason I didn't join Occupy right away was that um, I wasn't all that impressed with their tactic of occupying the space. Um, it didn't work out, obviously, uh, especially here in, Ch in Chicago, other places went a little longer. Um, it wasn't viable and the police broke it up pretty quickly. It was a good attempt, but um, at any rate, I wasn't you know, really that enthused by that. Um, but I was certainly watching Occupy uh, from a distance uh, with a lot of interest. Um, and what really piqued my interest uh, what really got me excited was this thing they called the General Assembly. I'm sure that uh, just about everybody here knows about Occupy's infamous General Assembly. <clears throat> it's uh, the meeting of the whole group. And uh, you have this thing called um, a stack where people line up, and anybody who wants to uh, is free to speak uh, to, the, to the entire group. Um, there's com complete uh, equality in Occupy. Uh, there's no boss, director, or president, or anything of the sort. Uh, they call themselves leaderless. They call themselves a horizontal organization. Um, and decisions on the uh, issues on the agenda are made by uh, majority vote. Uh, in Occupy's case, it's actually supermajority um, approaching a complete consensus. But anyway, it, it's in the spirit of democracy, majority rules. Um, so I thought, um, you know, this, is, this sounds like what, I, what, I, what I'm looking for. So I went out to check uh, an Occupy General Assembly. They're meeting at this place called CIRMAC. Uh, we ended up calling it CIRMAC. It's on CIRMAC Street. Um, and uh, that was their indoor meeting place that they found. This was uh, in the middle of, of the winter. Um, this was January of uh, 2012. Um, and uh, sure enough, uh, here, was, here were people uh, practicing democracy, uh, internally at, at any rate, within the organization. It was uh, literally a dream come true for me. I, literally, I had been dreaming about this sort of thing. I, it was a, it's a recurring dream. It was a recurring dream. Now that it's happened, I don't you know, necessarily dream about it. Uh, <laughs> Um, so um, I abandoned this attempt of mine uh, where I was trying to form this new organization and I joined Occupy, I jumped right into it. So um, like I said, Occupy started out, you know, occupying, um, and this didn't last long in Chicago. And hold on a second, I'm getting thirsty out here. <coughs> I don't know why they made such a big deal out of that Marco Rubio thing, the guy just drank a little bit of water. Anyway. Um, so um, Occupy moved right into uh, becoming a protest group. Um, you know, moved out of the occupying phase into uh, protesting. 
public uh, rallies and marches and demonstrations of all kinds on all kinds of issues. <clears throat> and I, you know, was involved in those, um, and it was fun. But um, I wasn't all that impressed with protesting as such, uh, protesting alone. Um, I had joined Occupy because um, I thought I might pursue a program of making the country democracy. Um, so I was constantly talking about the need to move on from issue-specific protests to challenging uh, the system as a whole, um, to spread the democracy that we practice within Occupy uh, to the larger society. Um, I got some support from a number of occupiers. Um, in fact, um, a few of us joined uh, a, a, a democracy committee within Occupy. Ken right there was one of those guys. Um, and an opportunity uh, arose uh, for us to pursue this bigger program uh, with the 2012 election. And as you recall, Obama was up for re-election. So uh, some of us started um, an Occupy Obama campaign. We formed an Occupy Obama committee. And this was an, anti an exclusively anti-election campaign where we argued that uh, the representative system itself was a problem. And uh, to vote for any of the major party candidates was buying into the system. It was playing the plutocrats game, uh, which is uh, completely hopeless. <clears throat> so um, now, the Occupy Obama campaign uh, was the most important campaign that uh, Occupy ever did. Um, but it was also pretty decisive, uh, excuse me, divisive. Um, what happened was that uh, several uh, members of the Occupy Committee, um, the Occupy Obama Committee, I should say, um, and these were some of the best and the brightest, some of the most energetic uh, people um, in, in, in Occupy, some of the natural leaders, honestly. Um, they showed that they really didn't understand democracy, which was quite a revelation to me. Um, they didn't really have a democratic sensibility. Um, there were a lot of discussions and meetings um, leading up to the um, Occupy Obama rallies. Um, and uh, many occupiers had a problem with the main action that we were planning, uh, which was to burn our voter registration cards uh, as, a, as a symbol of our disgust with the entire system. So some people, uh, as you can imagine, um, it wasn't that big of a surprise, felt that uh, this was an insult to uh, blacks who fought for uh, you know, the right to vote in the civil rights movement. You know, tremendous struggle, right? And some people um, just weren't ready for a, a frontal attack on the entire electoral system, the representative system. But um, despite these uh, disagreements, uh, the hardcore committee members, I was just one member of this committee, um, they didn't want to negotiate <laughs> or compromise, mm -hmm. hardly. <clears throat> um, we had a, a lot of support for the uh, campaign in general. You know, people know that the system is messed up. But they didn't, uh, there wasn't anything like a consensus on this uh, specific action of voting for, uh, registration cards. And uh, some of us thought, you know, well, it's not really essential that we do that exact thing. We can do other things, and we can, in fact, we ended up doing other things. Um, as well as burning voter registration cards. We did go through that. But anyway, uh, so the uh, committee uh, basically steamrolled over the opposition, over a lot of people. And then, uh, worse yet, these extremist uh, committee members uh, started disparaging the occupiers who dissented, um, saying things like they weren't real occupiers. Um, here we are doing all the work in this committee, and then they come around you know, in, in the General Assembly and tell us what to do. Um, and so they started looking down on other occupiers and treating them as, in, as inferior. <clears throat> and they also uh, didn't seem to understand what a committee is. Uh, a committee, uh, and I had to you know, spell this out, uh, but uh, unfortunately it didn't get through, is a subgroup that works for and in, uh, in the interest of, of the large group and is accountable to the larger group. It doesn't do any darn thing it wants. Uh, but they you know, would harp on autonomy and you know, we, we're going to do whatever the hell, the hell we want. Um, you know, what's the point of that? Um, in that case, it's a separate group, right? Um, so <clears throat> the Occupy Obama campaign engendered um, a lot of animosity as you can imagine. And a schism actually resolved. What was it? A schism. Oh. Yeah, you know, division. Uh, right after uh, the Occupy Obama rallies, um, uh, which were held a couple months before the election, logically, we should have gone right up to the election, right, with this campaign. Uh, there was no sense, there was no reason to stop right then there. But these people, uh, uh, these uh, hardcore uh, members were uh, disgusted, and uh, the committee broke up. The campaign broke down and it's completely stopped in its tracks. And um, so th these people, were, like I said, were sick of, the, of occupying, especially the General Assembly. They, they, did, they didn't want to hear dissent 
they didn't really want to negotiate, whatever, okay, so, um, so they ended up uh, working in smaller groups on limited uh, campaigns, on issue-specific campaigns, they told me explicitly, uh, we want to work small, you know, we're tired of this big brand of design that you have, <laughs> um, and, and campaign, they tried that campaign. Uh, and they stopped coming to general assemblies, and uh, they even stopped calling themselves occupiers, um, and they took a lot of people with them. So it was a very serious, uh, um, you know, a schism there. And in fact, uh, from that point on, this was the fall of 2012, uh, there was a continuous fragmentation and attrition in Occupy Chicago. And it was very dispiriting, as you can imagine. Um, and it was, there was no stopping it. It was a, 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 a complete um, a downhill slide. Um, and in the end, there were only a handful of people coming to General Assemblies, just literally three or four of us. And uh, uh, we said, <laughs> you know, to heck with this, Occupy is dead. Okay. Uh, Occupy Chicago, anyway. Other Occupies, Occupy Naperville, uh, was more vibrant, but Occupy Chicago was not a going concern. Okay. Uh, take it from me and uh, a couple of others here. Um, it, it lost its appeal. Um, it just wasn't happening. Um, so we decided to start a new organization entirely because our program was not finished. Our program, uh, as, as we were uh, infusing into the remnants of, of Occupy, was to create a, a real democracy in this country. So, um, before I describe this new organization, I'd like to do a little post-mortem on Occupy. And uh, I think, you know, we should learn from this experience. Um, and I think there were two main reasons why Occupy broke up and why it didn't embrace uh, a democracy agenda. One is that Occupy uh, was extremely heterogeneous, okay? It was a very mixed bag of activists. They had a wide uh, range of interests, a, a large uh, range of the, uh, ways that they wanted to operate. There was uh, never a unitary program. And in fact, uh, there was a lot of resistance to a unitary program. Um, in fact, Occupy uh, can hardly be called an, or, uh, an organization. It was uh, hardly a cohesive organization at all. Um, in fact, when you called it uh, an organization, or when you wanted to call it an organization, uh, some occupiers say, no, we're not an organization, we're a movement, <laughs> a coalition. You know, everybody does their thing. Excuse me again. <clears throat> Um, okay, everybody you know, wants to do their own thing. So it was very loose, and uh, there were people coming and going constantly, as some of you were, were not by uh, no. Some people, sometimes, you know, you'd see somebody, uh, and you'd never see them again. you see them once across and never again. Um, in fact, uh, most occupiers were not uh, really serious activists. Um, and, and it's understandable, you know, these were people from all walks of life. Uh, they were, uh, a lot of them were caught up in the moment. A lot of them were unemployed and had free time on their hands, temporarily on their hands. Um, they were students, uh, naturally, you know, um, often have, have uh, spare time. Um, and overall, there was just too little solidarity and togetherness. Um, it was very fragmented. Um, another reason, and this is a little deeper, uh, why Occupy didn't uh, uh, get into this radical democratic program that some of us were pushing, is it uh, is because of the ideologies of uh, a lot of, of most occupiers. Most occupiers were uh, anarchists um, or socialists or liberals or some some variety or some combination of those. Um, and I, I studied this stuff. Okay, so uh, I, I'm going to get a little a wee bit academic here. Uh, anarchists um, don't believe in government, I and mean, that's the core of anarchism. We can argue about any all of this stuff, but that's that's what I understand. And they don't think uh, in terms of structure. Um, they don't think in terms of power. Um, and uh, structures of power, forget it. Okay, um, that's that's a definitely a definite no-no. Um, but democracy is a form of government. It's majority rule. It's it's not a structureless association of loosey goosey people sitting around the campfire or whatever. Okay, um, socialists um, don't have a problem with government as long as that government pursues the policies that they prefer, uh, especially economic policies. They actually, uh, socialists actually have, uh, if, if you, anybody studies socialism, you'll know this, they have actually little to say about power or political systems. They're not interested in democracy as such. They're not interested in the people uh, ruling. They're interested in, uh, quote unquote, social justice. And I don't say these things in a disparaging way, and I sounded like it, but um, this, I think it's just the, the facts, okay? Um, and um, that's not the same thing as democracy. Um, Democracy to a lot of socialists is at best a means uh, to an end. 
uh, not the thing itself. And some of them, uh, we had discussions like this among many of us, and some of them told me this explicitly. This one guy, I'll never forget that discussion. We had a good long discussion, and he said just, just what I just told you. Um, and then there are liberals, there were a lot of liberals in Occupy, and um, they, liberals uh, still have faith in the representative system. They just want to reform it. Uh, they want to, uh, or work through it, they want to get better candidates, third party candidates uh, sometimes. They want to, uh, you know, get ca campaign finance reform. Um, they basically believe that uh, we uh, more or less have a, a democracy, uh, um, a flawed one, um, but fairly close, and uh, it needs some tweaking. Okay. Um, so those are um, the ideologies, the ideas held by a lot of occupiers, um, which is understandable because, you know, occupiers, like I said, came from all over the place, right? Um, Democracy for the USA, this new organization of ours, has a very specific program. Uh, and uh, we favor a, a specific kind of government, democratic government. And um, uh, in our uh, way of looking at things, uh, a democratic government has two parts, a legislature and an, an uh, executive. And uh, the model that we take as, a, as our model is the ancient Athenian model. Um, in Athens, there was an assembly an assembly of citizens that uh, came together in, in the thousands. And uh, this was the legislature, the sovereign decision-making body. Uh, the executive um, or bureaucratic part of the government was the Council of 500. And this is a, a very interesting body. Has anybody, uh, how many people have heard of uh, Athens Council of 500? I'd like to see a show of hands, okay. Um, it's pretty ingenious. Um, there, were five, there were 500 people chosen uh, randomly from the citizen body, literally, by, by lot. They had this. Uh, machine, kind of like our lottery machines that you see on TV when they pick a lottery. Um, and uh, so the, the body uh, of citizens, uh, that those 500 citizens, was a representative sample, literally, it was a representative sample, um, or a microcosm of the entire uh, citizen body. It wasn't a bunch of elites, it wasn't uh, millionaires or tools of millionaires by any, by any means. Um, so both the, the um, legislature and the executive were made up of ordinary citizens. Uh, the people actually rule themselves. Um, today, we can create an expanded version of this uh, sort of democracy uh, fairly simply. And I'll show you with the handout. And also, we have um, a website, democracyfortheusa.org. And uh, this is all laid out much nicer and, and more elaborately and more beautifully on that website. Um, you would have um, uh, community assemblies in every, or assemblies, I should say, in every community, and with a corresponding uh, council. It doesn't have to be 500, but it has to be uh, in the hundreds. It has to be a large enough. Uh, 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 body to uh, be represented when you, when you pick them randomly. And then you have uh, an, uh, an executive council uh, in every city and state um, and also at the national level. Um, to better explain um, the difference between protest tactics and a democracy program, I'd like to use the analogy of a car. <clears throat> Imagine a, a car traveling down the road and it's traveling um, at a leisurely pace, uh, like, uh, this is the, the ship of state, okay? We're going to uh, have this car represent the city of Chicago. And like, um, like a, a government, uh, the, the car moves pretty deliberately and slowly. Um, and it's headed in a corporatist, privatizing direction. That's exactly what uh, this city is, is, that's the way this city is, is moving. And uh, who's driving this car? Mayor Ron Manuel is driving this car. He's the boss, he's, he's the mayor. And um, so this car is serving the interests of the rich and powerful. And the people uh, are lined up on either side of the road. Uh, they're the citizens. Uh, they're basically spectators. In our form of government, the citizens are basically spectators. Um, but among these people are activists. And they want the car to turn and go in a different direction to serve the interests of the people. So what do they do? They stand on the side of the road, uh, hold up signs, and shout at the driver. Mayor Ronald Manning was a passive guy, right? Um, well, that doesn't work too well. Um, so it, when that doesn't work, they go up to the car and they, they you know, lean against it. They try to nudge it, physically. Uh, that doesn't work uh, too well either because the car is a, a massive machine. Governments are, are formidable machines. Oh. We're just uh, individual you know, people, small people, especially small groups of activists. You know. Um, so finally, some activists do uh, something really dramatic. They jump in front of the car. This is civil disobedience, the analog of civil disobedience. Well, Ron uh, Emanuel just uh, has the police drive him away. Or uh, he doesn't actually do this, but he could run him over. 
And uh, nothing, you know, this does nothing they do change. Right. Yeah. Nothing they do changes the direction of the government. Um, changes the course of, 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 of the government. What is the solution to this problem of this car going down the road um, with the people not being able to alter the course, the direction of this car? The solution uh, is to go up to the car, open the driver's uh, door, grab Ron Emanuel, pull him out of the car, and throw his ass into the street. Then the people collectively get in the driver's seat, and then they control the car. That's what we need to do. Um, finally, I'd like to uh, turn to a historical note. The last uh, real revolution in the English-speaking world was the English Revolution of the 1640s. The American quote revolution was a war of independence. It wasn't a thorough revolution at all. Uh, the parliamentary class in England basically brought down the monarchy and took power. This was a transformation from monarchy to oligarchy, which was extremely radical at the time. People talked about the world uh, turned upside down. What the heck is going on? Our beloved king, you know, uh, is no longer in power. Who are these you know, parliamentarians? Um, <clears throat> there was a civil war. Uh, at the height of the revolution, um, the parli uh, parliamentarians executed the king because he wouldn't let up. That guy, uh, King Charles, he just would not let up. He would not uh, give up his power. Um, the very next day after doing that, they eliminated the parliamentari uh, parliamentarians, eliminated both the House of Lords and the monarchy itself. Not just this king, not just the, uh, they didn't uh, replace this one king with his son or his cousin or whatever. No, monarchy has to go. And this is what they declare. The office of a king in this nation, and to have the power thereof in any single person, is unnecessary, burdensome, and dangerous to the liberty, safety, and public interest of the people of this nation, and therefore ought to be abolished. So the English Revolution took society from monarchy to oligarchy. Our job today is to take us from oligarchy to democracy. <clears throat> and today, we would say, the offices of president, Congress, Supreme Court, governors, state legislatures, mayors, city councils in this nation, and to have the power thereof in any small set of people is unnecessary, burdensome, and dangerous to the liberty, safety, and public interest of the people of this nation, and therefore ought to be abolished. Yeah, that's it, thanks. Okay. Okay. We can have somebody hand it out oh. while you take questions. All right. Yeah, okay. we're going to have the question and answer session now. Yeah. Sure. All right. All right. No. Let's get into the question and answer session. No. First of all, there, you're going to be the one answering the questions, not me. Okay. Now, first of all, uh, all right, I just want to remind everybody that, again, all questions must end with a question mark. Now, if you have a question, raise your hand. Okay, you got a question, Tim? Yes. Oh. Considering the problems you were having in governing a loosely governed coalition like Occupy, how would you expect a similar system to work over the multifaceted budgets of a city like Chicago without factionalism, without having fundamental respect for the rule of law, or even a small city like I live in in Algonquin, which still has a $50 million budget that you know, they need to keep streets going, they need to keep roads repaired, they need to keep fundamental services going. So how is your group going to handle the multiplicity of complaints? What kind of structure are you going to put in? Because I personally, I think the parliamentarian system and elections work very well so far. Okay, well that's... Okay. But the that question is, what, how are you going to implement this okay. to, to take on this complex role All the right. government provides? All right. Okay. <clears throat> Athens, um, uh, had a uh, democracy kind of like described, and it worked for 200 years. Athens was uh, a big, bustling uh, city-state with a large uh, uh, um, area called Attica, uh, the countryside. It was uh, a city of tens of thousands of people, and they were able to do this. Um, we had problems in Occupy, as I said, because uh, some, of our, some of us Occupiers um, didn't you know, really uh, understand democracy too well. But it, uh, Occupy did work reasonably well a lot of, most of the time, a lot of the time. Um, the, the system that I'm talking about, uh, that I um, advocate, is something that's going to have to be uh, uh, developed and educated. Uh, people are going to have to be educated into it. 
um, the representative system, before it came into being, uh, was not accepted right off the bat. Um, there were, as I said, people in the time, at the time of the uh, English Revolution were like, you know, we've had kings ruling us forever. We like this uh, halter. We like the, these, these uh, the yoke around our neck. Um, a lot of people did. Um, so this uh, transformation, a revolutionary transformation, um, is a difficult thing. And it takes time, it takes, even, even if you have a successful revolution, uh, there will be a reaction, there will be a time for period of people to get used to it, et cetera, et cetera. It's, not a, it's a gradual thing, in other words. Uh, there, and there are going to be problems. Um, that's the best I can say right now. All right. Um, all right. Uh, Bob, you had your hand up. Uh, I was reading your website of the new organization, Democracy for the USA. And on that website, I noticed you juxtaposed the income inequality issue with the worsening global climate crisis. Can you put forth on the table the evidence to support this juxtaposition? And then if you can justify it, what strategies will you exist to move forward on the, uh, this purported feedback between the two issues? Um, I don't recall uh, any such elaborate uh, justification. Uh, um, did Bob, did you write something about it? No, I'm wondering uh, speaking. Okay, what do you mean by a juxtaposition? By juxtaposition, I mean the feedback between the two issues. Okay, there might be um, one or two, um, well, we have a lot of links. Uh, I have some of my views that I'd like to hear yours. Oh, okay, let me, but I'm trying to get to, I understand your question. There are a number of links, in fact, a whole lot of links on our website. Uh, more than likely, you uh, read... It was a discussion in the body of the text. Okay, but who's the text? Who's the author of the text? www.democracyfortheusa.org. I noticed the statement in there, and that's why I raised the question. You may, you may have said something somewhere about the climate being something that we're suffering because of... Yeah, yeah, we have a lot of problems. Climate is one of them, um, and income inequality is another. I, I'm just honestly trying to figure out what do you mean by juxtaposition? What, what's the issue here? A juxtaposition means a connection or interrelationship. When one issue is impacted, the other one is impacted as well. I thought that was a very intriguing statement. That's one of the reasons I came to that, because I was hoping to hear an elaboration of that thesis, which is on this website. You'll, if you go to the website, you'll find that in there. And so, therefore, I came hoping to hear from you uh, some amplification of that uh, position. I, I, I have my own view, but I'm asking you for your views. Now, maybe my view right. doesn't coincide right. right. with your right. perspective. I, on. I have your. Bob, you Bob is, a, is a member who worked on that website. Go ahead. Yeah, I think I understand where he's, okay. where he's speaking sure. of, where he may have, either one of us may have put in the text something about that we're going from one crisis to another uh, uh, without any relief inside, something like that because of the current Government. I have it here. I think. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Is, yeah. is this what you mean, sir? Uh, yeah. There are no two ways about it. If we want to change the way things operate in the city and the country, rather than suffer endless assaults on our collective well-being while witnessing the destruction of the planet, it is imperative that we replace the current dysfunctional system of government with democracy. We yeah. rule the people. We have very little uh, alternative and low time. Is that what you're talking about? Absolutely. I All thought right. that was quite a statement. I, and I'm asking you for amplification. Some of the evidence you could put on the table to support that, and then given that evidence, where do we go forward with, with uh, programs to deal with that juxtaposition? Okay, um, I think the evidence is um, um, huge and incontrovertible <clears throat> that we have uh, climate change. Um, okay. There's also uh, assaults on our well-being in, in all kinds of ways, economic, the rich, um, you know, uh, not paying the taxes and uh, garnering all the uh, profits from our labor, that sort of thing. Um, I do not, myself, do not um, uh, get into the specifics of, of particular uh, 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 policies and issues as much as I think about the uh, entire system, the way we make decisions. So uh, these kinds of um, issues, I think, are plain to just about everybody. And the question is not to, for me to uh, study and think that much about climate change or wealth inequality. Uh, the problem to me is that people don't have the power to do anything about them. 
Um, so I'm not, I, I do not really, uh, you know, uh, worry that much about the evidence. I mean, I, I've looked at it, but uh, climate change, wealth inequality, uh, you know, wars, constant wars, these kinds of things, um, maybe I threw out those terms because to me they're self-evident that these things are happening. Uh, my concern is how do we get uh, ordinary Americans to uh, do something about it and, and, just, and, and not just yak about it, about these things endlessly, and to hear politicians yak about it endlessly. Okay? Uh, the question is uh, one of power, not the details of these issues. Um, but if you want to uh, correspond with me, talk to me later, or, or whatever, I would be happy to. I just didn't understand uh, exactly what you were driving at. Well, I did appreciate you guys putting that on the table. Okay. Okay. All right, all right. Uh, Ayala, you had a question. Yeah. I also have an answer for that, but maybe for the uh, Anthropocene question. And before the question, Athens was great, but they had slavery. So my question is about plausibility. Your heart is in the right place, I think. You're preaching to the choir here in a way. But how do we get there? Some practical solutions to get there, I don't know, within the next 50 years, 100 years, or whatever. Uh, with all the obstacles that we have, <coughs> with the culture of amnesia, with the attachment to the Constitution. I know that there are different uh, problem-solving um, suggestions, like Lawrence Lessig in Republic, um, what is it? Republic? Yeah. Um, what do you think of the, 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 the chances that we will really get rid of the campaign funding issues that are responsible for this plutocracy or oligarchy? I don't think campaign funding um, in and of itself uh, is, is um, the cause of, of plutocracy. I think plutocracy is built into the system. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, this was known at the time of the founding, 1787. There were these people called anti-federalists. Um, I'm not sure there was even much campaign funding going on then. The, the fact of the matter is when you vote a few people into office, they're going to be prominent people. They're going to tend to be rich people. They're not going to be ordinary people at all. So you automatically form an elite. Um, I think that, uh, to answer your question about how, how we get there, there are, there are no blueprints. Um, the English revolutionaries had no blueprint just months before the English Revolution. Um, and the Russian revolutionaries had no blueprints for, you know, in the years before. Revolutions happen actually relatively uh, uh, quickly. Um, and uh, the, the, way, the way we get... Hmm? It ended in a disaster. Well, I, right. I'm not you know, trying to say that you know, our revolution, when it comes, is going to end up any particular way. I'm just talking about the phenomenon of revolution. Uh, people don't go into them uh, with, uh, with blueprints. Things happen um, uh, all of a sudden. Okay, and, 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 and also people work things, work through the problems. Um, I don't have uh, uh, this blueprint that you, know, you kind of are asking for. As for uh, slavery, Athens had slaves, but they didn't make up the, um, uh, the, the entire working class. Okay, they didn't, uh, uh, Athens was not a society with a, a, a small, a tiny elite, and then all the workers were slaves. Uh, that actually described more, um, probably a little bit more of the Southern uh, American plantation system. A lot of them were boat rowers. Uh, they were boat, uh, boat rowers. <laughs> right. They were construction workers. They were farmers. Uh, the uh, people that made up uh, the Athenian government um, in the assembly, that came to the assembly, and also the Council of Avenue, uh, most of them were uh, uh, poor. Um, Aristotle uh, was, and the elites in Athens were constantly complaining about how the poor or run this, run this country, run this society. Um, maybe I've gone on a little too long uh, this question. Okay, uh, Mark, you had a question. <coughs> Follow up on this. Are you proposing armed revolution is the way to put this in place? Excuse me? Are you proposing that armed revolution? Armed revolution. Uh, no, uh, I don't um, propose um, or favor armed revolution. I favor revolution. Um, the now, examples you used were armed superior force. They. A revolution, uh, this is an interesting question. A revolution is a transformation in ideas, essentially. <laughs> um, and then when it comes to uh, implementing it, 
you run into uh, resistance from the people that have power. Now, it's up to those people who have power to uh, say, okay, well, this, uh, we shouldn't have this power. Uh, well, our power is legitimate. We should give it up because it's wrong. Okay. Now, unfortunately, they tend not to. Uh, I mean, when that happens, I'll be elected the queen of the bank. Exactly. Right. So, so then the people have to do what they have to do. I, I would love to never, uh, you know, pick up a, a weapon of any kind. Uh, and, I, and that would be the ideal. Do that would be the ideal revolution. How about if we do that someday? Do it with a Google group. Yeah. Maybe, then maybe we can do it. Okay. Sir, did you have a question? Yeah. When you consider the complexities of 30,000 or 300,000 in Greece and 300 million in the United States and the technology and complexities, do you think that the fact that we now have the internet would make this possible with all of the complexities they're faced <clears throat> with the approach that you're talking about? Because if we didn't have the internet, I don't know how you'd ever do it in, in terms of any kind of speed or, or right. efficiency. Do right. you think maybe the internet could make that difference? That yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the internet and just our, our means of communication in general. Uh, at the time of the founding, uh, you know, representatives had to uh, uh, ride by horse to Washington from, let's say, Georgia, where right? it would take them weeks or whatever, right? Um, so, uh, communication at that time was uh, very slow and it would have been difficult. Not, I, I'm not sure, I wouldn't say impossible, but it certainly would have, would have been difficult to uh, uh, make a, an actual democratic system. Uh, today, um, not just with, with the internet, certainly, but even before the internet, uh, with fast mail, uh, snail mail, uh, television, radio, um, people uh, simply uh, communicate a lot quicker today. And then, and then on top of that, uh, the internet, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually instantaneous. So people can discuss issues um, and be ready, you know, come to an assembly ready to do, uh, do these things. They could communicate to the, to the uh, Council of 500 to, you know, do X, Y, or Z, uh, and, uh, and they would do it. Athens uh, had, uh, you know, a primitive uh, communication system, right? Uh, had had any technology. They were able to do this. Um, and they were not uh, a little uh, uh, um, uh, uh, group of people. They were um, tens of thousands of people. Tens of, uh, it's, it's, it's not, I don't think it's as difficult as you might imagine, or I don't think it's as difficult as, as, as one might imagine, to go from many thousands to millions. Uh, I think the, 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 bigger, the bigger jump would be from a tiny little group of you know, us in this room to a larger society. Athens was a sophisticated society in its day. Everything's relative. Okay. Um, Rhonda, did you have a question? Yes. Um, excuse me. Uh, my question is, so clearly you, uh, you are a revolutionary and not a liberal, as you described those definitions. What's the biggest single issue about how things are working today? Is it war? Is it, you said everybody's on the sidelines. How, how do you come to that conclusion that people who want to participate in government can't do it can't really participate in a democracy unless there's some radical change. What, what's the biggest oh, thing yeah. that, your biggest reason for believing that? Um, I think it's the, uh, the plain fact of the matter, the logic of the situation. Um, when was the last time Ron, Mayo, Ron Manuel asked you whether or not um, you know, we should close schools in the city and, and public schools and, and make uh, uh, build charter schools? When did he ask you that? Well, he never asked me. He asked a lot of people, and then he ramrodded over them. But that's, uh, but that doesn't mean that they're not participating in the process. Uh, what, and what, kind, what, what kind of participation do you mean? Well, I mean, there are all sorts of people. I mean, for instance, in Hyde Park, they protested the closing of the Cantor School, and they actually managed to keep it open for a year. Now. You can make arguments, and you know I don't really know very much about it, but you could make arguments that because it's a wealthier community than some other communities, that he decided that he wasn't going to, I mean, I don't know what their, the basis of their arguments were. There might have been certain arguments that they used that, uh, that meant that the schools remained right. open. So you could say that some South Side community also, there were protesters, and they closed the school anyway. But the point is, those people are participating. The that doesn't mean that that there isn't participation. 
you can say it's not getting them anywhere, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know if that's true of every let, let issue. Me, let, so let, let me put it this way. Okay, I, I think I see what you're saying. Uh, I think that we might uh, um, be quibbling about the, the, the term, the meaning of the term participation. Powerless people can have influence. You don't have uh, power uh, in, in, this, in, this, in this form of government. You alienate your power when you vote for Ron Manuel or what, some other clown okay, to, to run the city. You alienate your power when you vote for some president or other to have, and, and then they have the power. Oh, Barack Obama, uh, tomorrow morning, can decide uh, that um, he's had enough of this world and put, press that red button and start a nuclear war. You don't have that power. Now you can you can you can write uh, Barack Obama. You can call the White House and you can say, uh, uh, you know, President Obama, would you please uh, start a nuclear war or not start a nuclear war? <laughs> so in that sense, you have, you can part, quote unquote participate, but you don't have the structural power. So people have influence of all kinds. In the days of kings, I think there were riots, there were uh, uh, rebellions. Uh, you know, people would come into London and and uh, and kill a few uh, uh, noblemen, and uh, and then and then what? Uh, it, was, it was still the king still had power. Um, so I think that we might uh, be best served by um, uh, making some distinctions. Yeah, people quote unquote participate. That is not sufficient by any means. That that is not equivalent to democracy by any means. All right, Charlie, did you have a question? <clears throat> yeah, Ted. One of the defining aspects of the Occupy, I thought, were the guerrilla type anti-establishment actions. I remember being at a meeting at the Union Week Club, and we had some fun. But how do you translate that you're trying to institutionalize this activity when it's the antithesis of uh, an institutional framework? Okay. Are you going to maintain the momentum? De democracy um, is not about uh, anti it, Once you have a democracy, if you, if you uh, uh, um, make a democracy, construct a democracy, and then you have uh, democratic institutions of government, um, then it operates democratically, automatically. You don't have you don't have to have anti-establishment activities. You know, protesting is not uh, a democratic act. Actually, uh, it's that it is an anti-establishment <coughs> act because you don't have democracy. Once the people can uh, assemble in communities and and discuss issues and and decide for themselves what uh, you know what they should do about these issues. And then tell the government, which is their government, because it's made up of working people just like them, to do uh, what they decide. Uh, then what would the use of um, the 99% protesting be? You, the 99% would have something a whole lot better than protest. They would be in power. Um, Sir, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, what do you think can be uh, learned from, like Martin Luther King, who did his thing without ever staring at the internet? Uh, well, yeah, there you go. Uh, that, that was awesome organizing, right? Uh, the Civil Rights Movement. Um, but I have to, whenever um, somebody brings, not that you necessarily did right now, at least not exactly, but whenever somebody brings up the Civil Rights Movement um, as a success in, in, um, in you know, protesting or um, quote unquote movement politics, I always have to interject, or I think to myself at least, that um, <laughs> social issues. Uh, and racial issues are actually uh, um, some of the easier things to resolve because there's a fundamental um, um, idea among people, white people included, that racism is fundamentally wrong. Um, the economic issues are much harder to tackle. So you get Barack Obama into office, what is he? He's a black millionaire. He's not a black homeless person. He's a black millionaire. Uh, and who does he answer to? A whole lot of uh, billionaires. A Jewish billionaires, okay? Um, so, uh, and then you have Hillary Clinton. What is Hillary Clinton? My God, right? Um, so, uh, it's easy to throw out these the, 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 these racial uh, paradigms, um, and then to cite the civil rights movement as a, as, a, a, as something you know to say that the system works somehow. Not that you're necessarily doing it right now, but that's what comes to my mind. Did I did I answer your question? Okay. Okay, Jeff. Did you have a question? Yeah, uh, outstanding answer to that question, by the way. Now, last week you and I had a bit of a discussion, and I ran a few names past you, urging you to look into them. 
Arch Druid John Michael Greer and Charles Hugh Smith, both folks who blog either once a day or once a week as the case may be, pertinent to in particular the, the way the Quakers do their meetings as opposed to this whole, the way, the way that Occupy and other groups on the left in recent decades have done their meetings. Insofar as you got a chance to look into what those folks have to say, I'm interested in any reflections, and depending on your answer, I'll probably need to follow up. Okay. <clears throat> um, I did look up um, Hughes, and I uh, read or, or at least skimmed some of his material. But I recall him, I don't remember him saying anything about Quakers. I, I, maybe I just didn't get to it. But okay. what, I, what I did see here and say um, was something to the effect that uh, the best way to fight this uh, um, economic tyranny is to take your money uh, out of corporations, um, to um, be independent, <coughs> economically independent. Um, that's, and, I don't, and that's the, the uh, major thing I think that he said from what I could tell. You might want to elaborate. Well, okay. Well, I, yes. When I, I, I use the word Quakers for you, if you would have Googled him and Quakers, mm -hmm. what you get uh, is the idea that the General Assembly would be a very different deal if they did it like the Quakers, whereby the only folks who had a vote were folks who were full participants who gave up something instead of just showing up when they knew a vote was going to be and and then and and thereby rigging so to speak in other words the drift of both of these guys is that with the Quakers say you can't vote unless you're a member and membership has requirements a b c d e f and g and we're going to separate if i may put it this way the men from the boys okay um I, I think that that might actually be um, a form of elitism, not, not necessarily economic elitism, maybe uh, ideological elitism or some other kind of elitism. I, um, I got that argument from okay. uh, some occupiers who said that, um, you know, we're, we're doing all the work because they were, they were natural leaders, okay? They call themselves leaderless, right? But everybody knows that they were actual yeah. you know, yeah. leaders. And, so, and they, were, they did actually do most of the work. Um, and I was right there with them watching them do the work. And then somebody coming out to the General Assembly who, you know, wasn't there, you know, until, uh, except for the last assembly, you know, not in between. And, um, the, you know, these people would have a vote on what this committee or these people, these activists, uh, were, you know, more hardcore activists were doing. Um, and my retort to that, and they had a problem with that. My retort to that is, look, um, if we want to make ourselves a model for democracy, what are you, you going to have? You're going to have... Um, you know, requirements, uh, when people come to the assembly, you're going to you know, have, have a guard at the door saying, okay, what did you do uh, yesterday, you know, uh, on this issue? Uh, hey, do you, so do you have a vote, you know, are, are we going to give you a vote or not? Um, no, I mean, people, you have to take people as they are. Okay. So, uh, another thing is that people uh, can do uh, various things. They don't all uh, necessarily do those uh, obvious things like make banners or whatever. Some people talk to their friends, some people uh, 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 do all kinds of you know subtle things, so it would be <clears throat> difficult to uh, you know I think make this gradation that you're talking about between real activists and false activists. Can I just clarify one thing? This is in the context of the idea of supermajoritarian blackballing by ten or twenty percent. You see, I know it's, if yeah if you had if it was run on a simple majority, that would be very different then having a general assembly might be more acceptable to the kind of folks I'm talking about. They're talking about where 10 or 20% yeah. people can show up and block everything and then just hike. Let me answer him. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah um, our, our, um, this model of democracy that I, I, I've been advocating is strictly majoritarian. It's not a super majority, which is a form of a minoritarianism, okay. right? Yeah. When, because then this 10 or 20%, uh, a minority, is able to uh, uh, you know, direct uh, you know, what goes on. Okay. All right, ma'am, did you have a question? So, from your presentation, I got the impression that you were saying that Occupy broke down because everybody kind of was going in a different direction, and if they had simply just practiced democracy and taken a vote, they could have all just agreed on one thing and gone in that direction, and they would have still been together? Is that what you were saying? Um, no, I'm going to say, yeah. I'll pause because I'm kind of setting you up here. Okay. Um, because um, my question is, is, do 
do you think if they really had practiced democracy, they still would be in, in full motion? Or do you think still some people would have felt like, I don't agree with whatever else is going to do. I'm going to go off and do my own thing. Mm -hmm. And if so, how is that going to play out on a larger scale? <clears throat> like, what brings cohesion to a group? And so to some extent, that's kind of what our oligarchy is doing, and it's giving us the same vision, whether we like it or not. And how do you get the same vision um, well, I, I think that uh, a lot of occupiers didn't really uh, um, get democracy very well. Um, and I think that if we're going to ever have a, an actual democracy, <clears throat> we're going to have to have um, people um, understand it a whole lot better than, than even occupiers do. Um, so um, we're going to have to have people uh, understand that um, uh, we have a community assembly, and majority rules, and then uh, and respect that majority. Uh, occupiers, um, as I explained earlier, uh, most of them were uh, some kind of anarchists. Okay, some of them were hardcore anarchists, um, and they literally uh, and they would tell me this specific uh, exactly. They would say, you know, I don't believe in this big organization we're trying to build. Here. Okay, and so they they want to do their own thing. Uh, um, they, t they would talk about uh, the autonomy of, of committees, okay? And Occupy had a, lot, a whole lot of committees. If there's autonomy of committees, what is the point of having one organization? Uh, so um, to try to answer your question, um, if we're ever going to build a democracy, people are going to have to be uh, better educated uh, on what a democracy entails and how it works and, and instill in people a democratic ethos, a de democratic sensibility, which was uh, Conspicuously uh, lacking, uh, even among these uh, activists who I would have been, I would have thought going into it would have been, you know, much more democratic. Does that answer your question? Or if not, if not, you want to follow up? It's okay. Oh. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. Any other questions? Oh, uh, Gene. Yo, know, yeah. You know, maybe I got the wrong idea, but to me right now it looks like your organization is two guys, ideas, and a website. I'm sure it's more than that. So, do you have a budget? Do you have uh, bylaws? Do you have uh, meetings? Uh, like that. Okay, first of all, you're way out. It's four people. And, 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 and <laughs> but but uh, <laughs> we do have our website and we do have our meetings. They're every Wednesday at uh, 1000 uh, North Milwaukee at Multiculti. Um, on the fourth floor, and there are elevators up, um, uh, for people to get up there. Um, we don't have a budget. Uh, we're, we're poor folks. I mean, uh, let me see. We just, you know, do what we need to do. I pay we're, for we're, the website. Huh? I pay for the website. Right, yeah. He, he's the website guy. Okay. Um, so we're, we're just beginning. Um, and um, it'll be some time before we have uh, the trappings, the, you know, the. Uh, Paraphernalia of, of, of a larger established organization. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, sir, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, if I could, real quick, you were talking about the Occupy thing. I was my right. I think it, the problem was the supermajority, because all their votes were on supermajority, and that 10 or 20 that we were talking could come in and destroy it. And that's, I think, the, the simple majority would be better, because I think it would have split off, maybe not as much as it did from what was happening, but it would have eventually probably fallen apart because of that, because like you say, it wasn't you know true democracy per se. So that I think that's it would have probably eventually fallen apart either way. I think, but it would have taken longer. And it, I think they should have changed. It. We tried to change it, and lower the threshold, and then people complain because you know it's like well you know. But that's a whole other story. But the, the question I have. Hmm? All right. Um, but I, 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 I sorry, I didn't have a question. I'm oh, sorry. Um, about the Athenian model, you I've heard you talk about this before, Ted. Um, you know, it, it looks good. I mean, I guess for the time, it was probably the best they could do. But how come it fell apart? Why didn't it continue on when? I don't know much about the history of it. When did it, because you said it lasted maybe a couple hundred years, did it fall apart because it didn't work? Or did it fall apart because something else happened to stop it? And why didn't they bring it back? You know what I mean? Yeah, well, why yeah. why yeah. isn't this still happening? Um, it didn't fall apart um, at all. Um, Athens was uh, conquered by uh, Macedonia. Yep. It was uh, conquered by outside powers. Uh, until that time, uh, that literally, hmm? literally up to that, that moment, it, it worked perfectly well. Give me a little time. All right. Uh, so yeah, why, why didn't they? Why didn't they bring it back later when 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 that 
changed? I mean, like okay, uh, the Macedonians put an end to uh, the democracy. They were uh, a, uh, a monarchy. Philip of Macedon was, and then Alexander the Great uh, were the kings, right? Uh, they um, had no use for, for democracy, and so they, they uh, squelched it um, you know, soon after taking over. Um, by, by the time Athens became an independent <laughs> nation, you know, hundreds of years later, excuse me, not Athens, Greece, um, you know, it was, this democracy was long gone. Okay, uh, ma'am, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, um, there are in the state legislature about 2,000 2, bills introduced by the Senate, over, I don't know, 6,000 or something introduced by the, uh, in the House, so the mind boggles when you have a public that is, isn't even uh, turning out at what? What's our rate of turn out, turnout? To vote. Uh, to vote, it's like 40% or something. So, uh, so I, I just, I, it just seems like things would not move at all. But my question really is about Occupy, and I'm aware that there are still people who were in Occupy that are still sort of carrying the banner. Uh, one group is in Wisconsin, and they're working together with a um, more of a, you know, like an older group. So some of these ideals are, are being, some of the, the things are being um, continued. And my question is, going back to Occupy, what do you see their legacy is, and where are they now? Do you know where any of these people are, and what are they doing? Um, okay, I don't know that much about other occupiers. Uh, I don't know much more about that than, than you know, ordinary people, non-occupiers. Uh, I went to, um, and a few, a couple of us went to um, uh, the occupy, uh, the national occupy gathering in um, Kalamazoo. Kalamazoo, Michigan, right? um, and uh, there were uh, a few. There were some people there. What, a hundred or two hundred? <coughs> okay, but it, that didn't, doesn't at all represent uh, occupy at its height. So. I'd have to say that you know, there's, you know, it's, it's declined. Um, I don't know uh, about uh, that much about other occupies. We we know that uh, uh, Occupy Wall Street, quote unquote Wall Street, uh, have been working on uh, Sandy and another a lot of other, some other things. I think that um, this um, more issue specific form of, of uh, quote unquote occupying has, has, has spread. Uh, smaller groups working on specific issues. Uh, here in Chicago, you have Occupy CPS. You had Strike Debt Chicago, you had um, Occupy um, this and Occupy that. And apparently, in New York at least, uh, that uh, seems to be the way they work. Um, I don't know uh, how, much, uh, how many occupiers have stayed very cohesive and have uh, you know, general assemblies. It's they work. worldwide. It's worldwide? Well, yeah, but maybe, I don't know about American occupiers. Um, Paul, may, could you maybe tell us a little bit about uh, Naperville? Like, have you stayed strong in you know, meeting in your general assemblies? Yeah, the, the numbers the numbers have dwindled. Uh, we had 13 people that met at our GA this morning, and we had some very good discussions about fracking and about charter schools and other issues. But it's hard for that size of group to get anything really done. Uh, so we're facilitators for trying to help on other issues, like you know, Northern Illinois jobs with justice and other kinds of things. So it, the size of the thing is a problem, but we're just as energetic as we ever were, and we keep meeting every Saturday. So yeah, I don't, I don't we go out for evening protests and have lights out, and cool. uh, you know, against uh, uh, Walmart, and mm -hmm. you know, we, we we participate. We're going to participate next Saturday. There's a uh, anti-TPP rally. Um, at Sheffield, and I can't remember the other street, but it's in Wrigleyville area, and then they're going to walk, march down to Quigley's office and ask him to take a position against Fast Track. And so we continue to work a lot of things. Um, also, here in Chicago, um, there are groups, uh, former occupiers, doing a lot of things. They just don't do it under the Occupy banner. Um, but to get to uh, uh, your first point, that, you know, that uh, carrying on government would be difficult for people when even the legislature, you know, how to handle all these bills and all that. Well, uh, you would have, you know, you get people to uh, work on these things and to come to assemblies. It would be an automatic uh, system uh, that is totally uh, uh, um, uh, not there, totally absent right now. Uh, so you can, there are community uh, meetings right now in a lot of communities, but they don't have any power. So it just, you have to imagine that that would be spread out throughout the country and it would be an automatic process. 
Um, it would just be a, a complete transformation. All right. Um, all right. Any other questions? Okay. I see some people have their hands up for second round of questions. But I have a, I have a question I'd like to ask. First of all, um, now you said earlier that you said socialists are not interested in democracy, um, and or per se, that they're primarily interested in social justice. But what about democratic socialists? Um, yeah. Okay, we we'll would define democratic well, socialists. Like the group like the Socialist Party USA, which we're on mass for years yeah, okay. of, or or um, or the Democratic Socialists of America, okay. or something like okay. that. You know, there's also or, or the Democratic Republic of North Korea. Um, Actually, it's probably <laughs> the Democratic People's Republic what? of North Korea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, 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 the term, the, name. the label. Uh, it should be. Okay. The label well, democracy is thrown around. Everybody's Democrat. Who's not a Democrat? Come on. Republicans, Democrats, uh, uh, Green Party, Democrats. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of Republicans actually reject the concept of democracy okay. now. They well, said the United States is not a democracy really? and, and never has been and should not be. It's a Republican. Mm -hmm. that, that, that could be a mainstream Republican. No, a, a lot of, I have been in contact with many Republicans and that's what they say, but I'm, I'm <laughs> kind of, I'm uh, monologuing now. My, my question, look, there, look, there, another, I'll give you another example of democratic socialists. There are, there are socialist parties in, in, in most European countries and, and also in the Latin American countries who call themselves socialists, or even if they don't call themselves that, that's their, their roots are in socialism. For example, the, uh, the Labour Party in Israel, um, the La I guess Labour Party in the UK isn't all that socialist mm -hmm. anymore, but, the, um, but you know, do you consider these parties to be, since they call themselves socialists, do you consider them anti-democratic? Uh, not you would certainly they insist they are in favor of democracy. Okay, socialism uh, is a vast topic, right? Uh, we could literally talk for days uh, about socialism. In fact, people do. Mm -hmm. they, they have these conferences, they literally go on for days. Um, and, and what do they decide? I don't know. Um, but uh, socialists in power, in, 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 that play part in politics, uh, in representative systems, are. Um, Technically speaking, um, you know, uh, involved in represent in representative uh, uh, liberal representative systems. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is what is uh, socialist about that? What what is well, no, the actual correct question is what is democratic about that? If when if you consider a dem democracy where the people rule, not some party, not, not some socialist party, not some socialist democratic party, not some communist party, not some republican party, whatever party. So when these quote unquote uh, democratic uh, socialist parties get into uh, you know play the electoral game and they get into power, uh, that is not uh, democratic as far as I'm concerned. So, so they think call themselves democratic. So according to your definition of democracy, no country with with um, with elected representatives is is really democratic. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Uh, okay, uh, okay, Jeff, you go ahead. You had your hand up before Bob did. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'll get right. you next, Bob. Yeah. All right, I want to go back to your analogy of a car with Rahm Emanuel. All right. And as I recall, your idea was the idea is to go and grab the door and pull it open and drag him out of the car and put huh. the people in the seat. All right. Well, I guess I've got to make this sort of a two or three part question. Um, can you imagine that there might be some people guarding the door? <laughs> okay. Insofar as there are, there are people guarding the door who won't let you and will succeed in stopping you from getting to the door, um, have you given any thought to such uh, alternatives as, for instance, shooting darts or bullets at the tires, or putting some sort of roadblock up that the car can't, he can't take the car where he wants to go. And who knows, we, I could maybe rattle off five or 50 other mm -hmm. options. Mm -hmm. um, we, um, Marx for the USA, <clears throat> um, are based on uh, certain principles. Uh, the tactics uh, of uh, a radical transformation, in other words, revolution, are something to contemplate and to figure out in the future. Uh, and, and, and we're not going to be the only ones working on this. Uh, when the revolutionary movement comes around, um, you get all kinds of people getting involved, and they do all kinds of things. And you have to you know, fight this fight uh, against the, the current system, right? Um, we do not uh, worry about um, or you know, concern ourselves with the, the details of, of, of you know, exactly how this is going to work out. Uh, 
We're, that's just beyond uh, our competence right now. All right, uh, Bob. Uh, given the success of Governor Scott Walker in Wisconsin of suppressing uh, the uh, <coughs> severing the social net there and suppressing worker rights despite massive protests and the comparable success of his clone in uh, the governorship in Michigan of instituting right to work laws and the inability of stopping pet coal burning in Detroit and I might say southeast Chicago as well. Does this indicate that and this that it's, it's more likely that we rather than having some sort of participatory democracy that people out of frustration might turn to someone uh, uh, an American clone of Adolf Hitler to move forward in uh, trying to rectify these things out of frustration? <coughs> Assuming the climate crisis doesn't destroy us first? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, I, I kind of doubt that um, Americans, you know, we uh, people, I think, are progressing, progressing on, 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 looked at on a, on a very broad scale. I mean, like cent uh, thousands of years, millennia, not just centuries, but millennia. Human beings are progressing. We, we once had uh, um, kings, okay? Uh, then we went to uh, uh, parliament, okay? And this is, uh, you know, I'm kind of repeating, but I don't think people are going to go back to rank tyranny. I think that we, uh, we may have learned something from the examples of, of, uh, of Hitler and Stalin and those types. I don't th and Americans are, fair, I think, uh, for you know, all that we critique our, our fellow citizens, I think Americans are fairly sophisticated. I think that any tyrant coming up uh, in, you know, in this day and age uh, would be kind of uh, obvious. Um, I think that uh, people are ready to talk about the system. And in fact, that's the, that's the talk that I do here. When, when you, you know, uh, look at, uh, uh, when you read these uh, progressive magazines, listen to progressive radio, people are starting to question more and more the way things work, uh, the way uh, government is structured. Um, I don't hear too much about, um, you know, some, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, 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 tyrant sort of personality or people getting behind such a, such a person. I, I, I kind of doubt that, actually. Okay. Um, all right. Demag you have a question, demagogue. Sir? Demagogue is the yeah. term. Do you have a question, sir? In, in, uh, in parliamentary systems, there have been periods, and Italy have, has had them, where there's so much turnover from government leadership and so forth that the government agencies are really running the country. They have the stability of being there for a long time, of understanding <laughs> what's really going on. And, and if you have people who are selected every year on a random basis, and I kind of like the random idea, and then you also have um, uh, the other key, the other key <coughs> beside the random is the, uh, uh, is the uh, yeah. Is, is it possible that, that these more st stable organizations would be really running things instead of these assemblies? Um, well, if you read uh, the history of the Athenian assembly, they decided uh, the important things. So we have a, an actual living example that we can examine. Um, when uh, you know there was a war uh, uh, coming up on the horizon with the Spartans, uh, uh, what's his name? Pericles um, came to the assembly and, and they debated, and he spoke, and they debated uh, whether or not they should go to war with Athens. With Athens, and he said, um, Spart after he Spartan, Spartan. Spartan. And, and, and after the debate, he turned to the people and he said, um, okay, we've gone through the, the pros and cons. Uh, you've heard what I have to say, you've heard what other people have to say, and a lot of other people did have things to say. And he said, it's time for you to decide. Uh, when, when we get to that point uh, where we've installed an actual democracy and, this, and, and we, we gather in assemblies uh, and the people um, literally uh, decide on the big issues, I think that that will kind of answer your question. There will there will be uh, bureaucrats, low-level uh, uh, you know uh, technicians, engineers, um, uh, you know whatever experts, whatever. But uh, when we have this system in place, um, and and it resembles the Athenian assembly, uh, which it's designed to do, um, then it'll it'll uh, be the people who <laughs> on the on the big on the big questions. Uh, all right, Rhonda, did you have a question? Yes. Uh, so he, I, it's interesting that Jeff used the analogy of the car. Uh, I had a different question about it, which is, assuming that you could 
throw <laughs> Rahm Emanuel out, and then you say that you want there to be a number of people now driving the one the car. I mean, even a bus, only one person drives the bus. And I, I mean, I'm not saying that, I mean, it, let's say that you took a bicycle built for two. I mean, there, somebody can step on the brakes and somebody can keep going, but I think there's still probably the front person steering. So I think our system of government, I mean, whatever its flaws, I think it at least tries to account for that kind of thing by having a, yeah, by having a, somebody who represents you. I mean, I think that's the purpose of it. What, what's your response? This, yeah, this car analogy is just that. It's an analogy. It's a metaphor. It's, um, it's not meant to be you know, uh, precise. When, when, you, when you throw a Ron Manuel out of the, out of the um, car, um, and, you, and the people get in the car, I said the people collectively, uh, not one or two individuals, not 10 or 20 individuals, uh, the people collectively. Just that, lean him out of the car. What? Just lean him out of the car. Yeah, or whatever. But, but uh, that, that would be the, uh, an entirely new system. And, and it's um, a fairly sophisticated system and, and an elaborate system, but it's designed to have the people collectively. Uh, in, in assemblies throughout the country, or in, in the case of Chicago, the people, people in assemblies throughout communities throughout Chicago okay, uh, decide on the issues uh, to be decided on um, in, in Chicago. So it would be an entirely different um, uh, system. Um, and this uh, example that the, or analogy that I used is very coarse, very, you know, very, um, uh, yeah. So. All right. Um, all right. Did anybody else have any other questions? Or, uh, Jeff? Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Let's go back to your example of your, your story about Pericles. Mm -hmm. All right. Now it's time to decide. Well, was he, how were those meetings run? I mean, was he calling the question as per Robert's Rules of Order? Did they have an equivalent of Robert's Rules of Order? Or is there actually a way that a meeting of the people can be run without somebody having some sort of more say than someone else? about such things as when the question is called. The, uh, the assemblies of the Athene of, um, of Athens were run by um, committees of the Council of 500. So, uh, uh, like uh, nine, um, or whatever the number was. Um, and so they would sit at the, at the front of the, um, of the, like they would be behind the front or whatever. I, I'd be currently, I'd be speaking, but they would be running the show. And, and, and they would uh, have moderators. Oh, moderate. Okay. Okay. And speaking, all right. Let's. Uh, we're going to have to go to rebuttal soon. But yeah. sir, you had a question. Yes. What good would it do throwing Rahm Emanuel out when the, the next one in, in line in the machine is would just step in? No. You have machine no. candidates over and over and over. No. Uh, when you when you throw Rahm, remember when uh, the uh, parliamentarians in in, in uh, the English Revolution uh, um, did away with kings? They did away with the monarchy. They didn't do away with just with that one king. Um, Cromwell said, uh, we uh, cut off the king's uh, head with the crown upon it. <laughs> okay. In other words, uh, we got rid of the whole shebang of uh, the whole system of monarchy. So when, if and when we get this democracy that I've been talking about, we're not going to have another uh, mayor follow Ron Manuel. We're going to have a whole new system get into the car. A whole new but, it works, but you don't have the system. You still have the machine running okay. everything. All right, we need to. Okay. It's a uh, process. All right. The, I think I think our speaker's point is that it wouldn't just be changing from one mayor to another. We'd be changing the whole system. Dial, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, you know, commonly there are two different definitions for democracy. One is that the Athenian uh, model is the uh, the majority. Uh, and the other one is the representative. So I, I would like to understand how would you maintain human rights uh, with what you said the minority will have to respect the majority. Uh, what about oppressive majorities of small minorities that only representation can address the issue? Okay, those are uh, excellent uh, points, and they've been brought up, um, you know, in many times in discussions of, of, of democracy. <clears throat> well, I have some radical uh, um, answers to those questions. 
Uh, first of all, uh, representative democracy is a contradiction in terms. It's just nonsense. Uh, there's no such thing. Um, representation, when, when uh, it's, it's a, and I think it's fairly simple to see, um, when you look at it, you know, plain and unvarnished. When you vote for John Doe or S Susan Smith to be into office, you're uh, erecting, a, 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 you're putting a master over you. Uh, you're putting a boss over you. Um, it is no longer democracy. Um, it, I'm not, I'm not, well, no longer democracy. It's not democracy at all. So that 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 idea is is, is uh, an oxymoron. Representative democracy. Oh, uh, as, for, go ahead, go ahead. as for human rights, um, democracy, uh, strictly speaking, has uh, nothing to say about human rights um, because democracy is a process uh, where people uh, decide by majority rule uh, what anybody's rights are or what to do about anything. Um, and the, the, the majority that we're talking about is not um, a racial majority, it's not a, it's not a demographic majority, it's uh, whatever uh, people decide by majority vote in, in, in the Senate. I've got a uh, in, this, in this gathering here, um, okay. it would be people of various uh, you know, uh, backgrounds. It wouldn't, you wouldn't okay. have this monolithic course majority uh, suppressing this monolithic and, and uh, um, stable minority on any given topic. We might, uh, we'll, not might, we will disagree on variety on any given topic, but the majority in each case, which will be a, a shifting majority, shifting individuals, will, will uh, have, uh, um, will win, win out you know, on those particular issues. So I think that we uh, have to think about uh, majorities and minorities in a, in a different way. Uh, oh, does Nancy Joe in the vote? No, no, of course not. Okay, I want to just ask a follow up yes, question sure, to sure. what you just said about sure. this. Sure. Yeah. Now, you said that you said democracy is, doesn't have anything to do with human rights. It's about the majority. <coughs> yeah. Let's say that we happen to live in a country where eighty percent of the of, of the people in this country consider themselves Christian. Mm -hmm. Now, if the if the if the eighty percent now I am not Christian. Eighty percent of the people are. Now, let's suppose the eighty percent who are Christians decided you twenty percent who are not Christian. This this isn't really your go country. to hell. Yeah, this is not really your country. You know, you can stick around, but just remember that we're running things, and, and so we're taking away your right to have any decision-making process, and we're doing this by majority vote. Majority must approve of this, and so it's too bad. It's too, so it's too bad for you non-Christians. Now, would you feel that this was a, a legitimate expression of democracy if it happened? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. If, if, if oh, hold on, if it happened, can you imagine Americans? Uh, deciding uh, all of us together after uh, discussions and assemblies throughout the country for weeks or whatever, right. that uh, any such any such proposal, it wouldn't even get be beyond the. the, yes. the, the it yeah. would in yeah. Tennessee. Yeah. It would in the state, of, not in Illinois, well, but it would in the state of wait Tennessee. Wait till the bellies right. get empty. Okay. 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 Well, that, I happen to be from the state of Tennessee, and I can tell you for damn sure that it would happen okay. there. Okay. Except it would happen in the whole United States. Okay. Except that the the, the national uh, uh, council and and. Uh, the, the body of the people at the national level uh, would not allow that right? nah. because they would have the ultimate power. The, the nation uh, supersedes uh, the states, so you wouldn't have any "quote unquote" state state rights, strictly speaking. Wait till the bellies get out. But, 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 but to answer, to answer your question more broadly, okay? Theoretically, um, hypothetically, anything is possible. Democracy is a process. It doesn't guarantee any particular result. It's not. It doesn't guarantee nirvana. Okay? It guarantees that people uh, collectively decide by majority rule. And uh, it, that's it. Okay. okay. All right. Let's go to rebuttals. All right. Uh, all right. Tim's saying let's go to rebuttals. John, rebuttals. did you have a question? Um, well, just one thing. Ted, the occupiers are a bunch of troublemakers. <laughs> uh, like that to me. And you're going to try to convert them okay, to okay, okay. an organization based on Ethereum. No. Not anymore. No. We've, we've given up on occupiers. Yeah. Forget occupiers. Uh, uh, we moved, we moved yeah, on. We moved on. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Um, Rhonda, did you have a question? No, no. I'm just raising my hand. I'm sorry. I have right. a okay, ma'am. Ma'am, did you have a question? Oh. Wait, wait. Is, it your, is your moving on in and of itself not being democratic? Because moving on from occupiers? Yeah, Occupy? because, I mean, why wasn't there a question raised about what are we going to do? I mean, I mean, in terms of like, put a vote on the table, there was. and everybody votes on there it. Was. And Nobody it, was there. <laughs> well, I mean, prior to that or something. I don't know. It sounds. It sounded like what you were telling in your presentation that you began.
forming this Democratic committee prior to its uh, termination, prior to the Occupy Movement's termination? Uh, there, there was a, um, a democracy <laughs> committee. There was a democracy committee uh, fairly early on in, in Occupy, while there was still a lot of Occupy. But uh, at the point uh, that we started talking and, uh, and planning to start a new organization, there were literally just a handful of people. So uh, we didn't um, we didn't come to a, 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 a large gathering of occupiers and, and say we're going to start a new organization. Uh, there was no more. There was no longer an Occupy to, to deal with. Um, it was gone. Um, and people abandoned Occupy. People uh, shunned Occupy. Uh, the, the, those those uh, uh, um, members that I explained uh, talked about, um, you know, the, the, uh, the quote unquote natural leaders. Uh, they said uh, bleep Occupy, <laughs> and, and they went and did their own thing. Yeah, there so, were three or four of us freezing on the street. Yeah. Corner. So and we had to do our. Own, we had to start anew. Okay. Uh, all right. Now, uh, okay. Any any other questions? No. All right. Uh, Let's have a round of applause for All right, now folks, let's go into the now before we um, before we go into the rebuttals, let me just explain real briefly how it works here, folks. You see these chairs over here, uh, five of them. These are the on deck chairs. So if you wanna if you wanna give a rebuttal speech, come over here uh, and and just sit in chairs and sit in the chairs in line and uh, and first person up now. Now, first of all, uh, apart from the people who are already sitting in the chairs now, uh, I just want to—I just want to show of hands. Let me just set this thing down here. I just want to show of hands. How many people? How many people want to speak? Raise your hand. I'm gonna, I'm gonna count and keep your hands up, folks, so as I can count them. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, I count eleven speak. Eleven people who want to speak, and our speaker that makes twelve. Uh, is Charlie in the room? Charlie. He isn't in the room. I'm going to count him as number 13. <laughs> so uh, four minutes each. Okay, you got you got the timer down. Uh, I I'll just I'll just time it with my watch. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. okay. First speaker, go go uh, come on down. Okay. Thank you all. Did you want to hear the microphone, man? Oh, okay. Thank you all. Uh, I think this is a really great discussion because we are at, as you know a terribly critical time in our country. We are really facing what, what amounts to a tyranny. We were on the verge of uh, having this government, which I believe is a rogue government, um, attack Syria, a country which was not a threat to us, and it is a, um, you know, it is a sovereign country. It was only because the speak people of this country in a huge amount spoke up and stopped a further war that we were able to, to, to stop it. Now, what I am seeing is a process of convergence that it's taking on. And where this will go, who knows? I think we're in such a transition period, we really do not know exactly what the next step is going to be in the country. But there is a convergence going on. And one of those is that you see organizations like Move to a Man that are um, partnering with many other organizations because we are realizing that we cannot stay in our silos. What we have to do is organize uh, locally, regionally, and nationally, and also internationally. So I think these are movements to watch. What's going to come out of this, we don't know. The last point I'd like to make, I think I have a few, maybe a minute left, is that no matter what system we have, it all comes back to what our values are. And if our values are wrong, as they have gotten to be here, where we care more about uh, things and materialism and acquiring than we do about people, then any kind of system will be subverted. So I think it's, it behooves all of us to take a position and say it as often as possible. We will not tolerate the kind of abuse of authority that we are seeing. We will not tolerate 
the kinds of policies that allow this country to attack other countries, to destabilize other governments all over the world. We will not tolerate that. We will say that people first, planet first, peace first, all before profit. Okay. First of all, let me thank our speaker tonight for putting on the table the very interesting issues of the historical perspective on how best to organize a society in which people can really have optimum human experience for lack of better terms. The only thing that really disappointed me about the presentation is not bringing up the issue of the pervasion. So this of guns in this society and how we deal with that when the majority appears to this uh, second amendment. I hope the speaker in his rebuttal period will address that issue. I'd like to see how we can juxtapose that within the framework of where he's going with the new organization. Uh, second, thirdly, I certainly appreciate what was on the website, the point I brought up, and which one of the members of the audience confirmed that there was a uh, attempt to juxtapose the income inequality issue with the uh, worsening global climate crisis. I believe that's a very imperative thing to do. And uh, I certainly don't claim to have the answers to that, but I might report on some ways I've tried to engage in this issue. I've been very engaged with the Jewish Council on Urban Affairs uh, for some years, which I think does some very good work on such issues of uh, human rights, uh, racism, eliminating that, and this immigration reform. I certainly have urged the last uh, two executive directors to juxtapose immigration reform with the worsening global climate crisis. And I cited as an example the uh, Little Village Environmental Justice Organization, which is helping to reconstitute a, the brigade, a landscape in a green, sustainable manner. So I think I tried to point out from the evidence I found that uh, climate justice and immigration reform have to be put together because the people in these immigration communities are subjected to some of the worst pollutions uh, known. We have the problem with the closing of the coal-fired power plants. And the vic quote, victims there were mostly were largely people from the immigrant, maybe Hispanic community. The other issue of income reform and the uh, worsening climate crisis. Uh, I, th I really I think the proposition put on the table in that website that the two are linked is very valid. Uh, Professor Robert Wright, a couple of weeks ago at the University of Chicago, was in town for the showing of his uh, in Inequality for All. And uh, he's met, met, he had tangentially referred to that issue. But I had a chance to talk with Professor Reich afterwards. And, I put on the table to him the proposition that building a green, sustainable economy will put more people back to work. There's evidence that the Pew Institute has had, but there are more green jobs being developed. This is a way to, to reform and also deal with yeah. the global climate crisis. Our, our, our citizens won't uh, move forward just to save the polar bears, but they will to save our own skins, possibly. And uh, Professor Rice said, yes, that is the, really the way to go. So I think that th there is uh, some movement in this area. The other thing we, of course, have to do is, uh, you know, the fracking issue, uh, the, the tremendous amount of investment. But we have to be able to convince our citizenry that this is not the way to jobs, but, uh, and we can't, can't use methane as a bridge fuel because of the terrible destruction that the greenhouse gas emissions of methane even worse than CO2. So if we can convince them to go to green jobs and bring up more uh, renewable energy, we're able to uh, move the economy forward and create more uh, jobs with benefits and stuff to put people back to work and support their families. The other thing though is moving to the scientific community. I happen to be a scientist too, and I can find whatever I can do. I'm sort of not empowered in the elite of the scientific community, but there's a lot of great ideas on wind, solar, geothermal, hydrogen. We've got to get those online to replace the fossil fuels so we can move our green economy forward. Thank you, and again to our speaker for putting forth on the table these very interesting issues which we all have to deal with.
to continue uh, um, your line of, of thinking. Uh, the example that the president at the time suggested called the public to get in prayer to pray that BP will set an account to uh, compensate for the damage it caused at the time. Or that um, a CEO, one of the CEOs in Monsanto is appointed to be the uh, head of the FDA. I mean, examples like that. Um, how plutocracy and, and climate or environmental issues are, are very tightly uh, related. Um, to go back to the, the what, but you know what bothers me about again is uh, I didn't get a satisfactory answer to how do we get to um, uh, away from or, or secure oppression from oppression of the minority by a majority in the model that you are suggesting, uh, already we have um, oppression in, in some ways. Uh, in some states, for example, uh, science classes include creationism. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Uh, as an atheist, I, I see that in, in many, many ways in, in the tax exemptions that churches get, and all kind of, now it's so-called peaceful or small things, but there is much more. Um, now, you took Athens, Athens is one, the kibbutz is another example of the small, the kibbutz as it started, not what it is now, uh, started as a rotation of leadership. There was a division of labor, and the secretary was, it's a Marxist model, the secretary was the organizer or the one that was coordinating the division of labor. But it worked well because of the rotation in leadership that nobody sat there too long to, to grow roots into the ground, okay? So, but again, it was a very small society, very small community. In a complex society, I don't know how you can get away from some representation. Now, you said better than oligarchy uh, to me. Um, it's not a, I don't know if it's a binary model. Um, what about, um, and I agree that we just tend to vote and then sit back on the chair and expect Messiah to perform miracles. Uh, and, and we need to change that kind of attitude and have checks and balances and be on, on our representative. We need transparency and we need to remind them that they are represented rather than worshipped. They are representing rather than worshipped. They are our public servers. Um, you know, Western Europe is, is an example of um, such a democracy um, with much better, I mean, there is some inequality, but it's nothing outrageous like here, there are safety nets. Um, as far as a, a, a successful bloodless revolution, Chile, you know, uh, yeah, Pinochet was, how was Pinochet uh, taken off through PR and elections? Okay, they had an access though to the media, and they they were very clever at changing the culture real fast to to the party of no. We saw that uh, in, in the field. So you know there are some other options to look at as far as making this very necessary change. Uh, Don, I guess when you stand up, I got, what, 15 seconds to left? Um, actually, I stand up when four minutes is up. Okay, okay, that late, okay. 
I'd like to have a one minute. Well, you want me to give you a one minute warning? It's yeah. Idea. Okay, oh, sure. Good 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 idea. Okay, well, uh, one interesting thing I was thinking of uh, is that I probably got this all wrong, but uh, President Obama was saying there was a line in the sand that we were going to go into Syria. And then suddenly he seemed to discover the Constitution and say, oh, we ought to go to the Congress. Well, what really happened is the people didn't want to go into Syria. So think about that a little bit. I, I would recommend four books that are, I'm thinking about. A Force More Powerful by Ackerman and Duval. I got that from uh, Char Charlie. Uh, uh, the Great Turning by David Horton. About all the fun little groups that are around the country. Thousands and thousands of them. And they might coalesce, possibly. And uh, Going Public by Michael Deacon, who talks about not just the economic sector or government sector, but the third sector. Who's that? That's us. Uh, and another book uh, by work called Working Democracy by Richard Wolf. Now, some of you should have heard of that. It was on Moyer. So you've probably heard of that. Anyway, I take that as my text. <coughs> now, let's get it to my level. I'm the chair of the, of the uh, Social Justice Council at Second Unitarian Church. Big position? Nothing. I got to run around and make sure that I find out what all these people want and try to get it together for a meeting. Uh, I'm totally powerless. Uh, Jane Adams Senior Caucus, I was chair three years. Same thing, I was powerless when I was chair. But now I'm a member. I've got a lot more power. Luella Barnett, who's the head of Jane Adams Senior Caucus, doesn't push me around. She asks me, she invites me, she talks to me. Uh, I think there is a, off in the distance, there is the possibility of things getting better. David Corton's book talks about that, but of course he says it might be the great turning or the great unraveling. We're at that spot. Where are we going? We will see. Uh, it was a good talk, very interesting. Made me think. Thank you. Let's get let's get off the theoretical and get to the practical. What you, Mr. Speaker, went through with Occupy is what any group of human beings go through when they have or start an organization. It'll splinter, it'll fracture, and it will go its own separate ways without some form of governing structure. And we have an effective governing structure for most organizations today. And that was done by a previous general who wrote a book on how to run public meetings, on how to take care of the business of a committee. And that book is called Robert's Rules of Order. Oh. <laughs> and as much as you may think that it's crazy, the reason why Robert's Rules of Order works is because it's a generally accepted principles or buy-in that most organizations will respect to conduct their public meetings. You know, the format of making a motion, amending a motion, voting on a motion, keeping the agenda straight up. It's a very effective and powerful tool, but it only works because it has the buy-in of the people running the organization. I can tell you from first-hand experience with a group called Toastmasters International, the local District 30 Chicagoland chapter, and being involved in their district leadership for over a number of years. We change leaders almost every year through an elective process that we have at a conference. And only the people who are credentialed members can do it. It must be an officer, it must be something else. And there's a desk that sits there and says, okay, you met this certain membership requirement, therefore you can vote. You may be able to represent two or three votes with the consent of proxy forms. 
and the ver versus even corporate governance, they still have a board of directors. They still have an annual meeting. They still have a process, albeit a little crazy, that you can have some form of effective democratic leadership with. But again, it's skewed much more recently these days to the power of management. Now, as far as I'm concerned, our government in the United States is ran pretty well. And it runs pretty good, as far as I'm concerned, because it is, an, it is a representative form of government. You're not going to have a true democracy with this many divergent points of views and this many different people without some form of full-time elected representation. In my own town of Algonquin, for example, we have a big annual budget. And they put out that budget every year, whether it be on the web or through things like this. But people expect from us certain government services like the roads being repaired, the schools being ran, the park district running, this kind of thing. And that takes a certain professional class of bureaucrats who have been trained in large-scale organizational behavior, how to keep employees motivated, how to keep things running. And for me, even an organization like Alcoholics Anonymous has something they call the 12 Traditions, where each chapter goes through an affiliation process, they run through things, and they, they keep the things going. It's the big thing for me is if there's enough buy-in, your system can work. But I don't see how you're going to get it. Okay. So I hate to keep harping on your analogy about the car, but, <laughs> but the no, point don't. is that the analogy actually works pretty well until the point that you throw around a manual out. Then you don't have a good analogy. You need another vehicle. And that's what you've been saying the whole night. We need another form of government. Or we need another, another form of democracy. So the analogy needs another vehicle. You need another way to say how a number of people are going to collaborate to have a democratic system of making decisions and, and running things. And I think that in terms of, the, the, I mean, it is a complex society, as not a number of people have pointed out. I'm not sure that it really will work, but you haven't even gotten to the point of where you're really saying how well you want that to work. So, or, you know, what, what your mechanism for that is, which I think a number of people have also pointed out. But I think that, that we all, well, I, I at least feel some empathy for your position because it's clear that you really want people to have a say in government and not just be on the sidelines. Uh, I think that although the talk was very interesting, I would be very interested also in the Occupy movement as, well, what, you said that a lot of the people were anarchists and a lot of people were this and a lot of people were that, but the question is, how many of those people were activists beforehand? And in what organizations were they existing in to begin with? Because I think that if we had some sort of uh, crisis, God forbid, where, for instance, there was a war, a world war, where people had to be drafted, you would suddenly find a lot of organizations would come together to fight that. You know, a lot of anti-war organizations that might not agree. I, I just the example that I can think of from the 70s, there were organizations that were against nuclear weapons. And they decide, and there was a splintering of a group that was against nuclear weapons because another group says, well, we're against nuclear power as well. And so, so what happens is when there is a crisis, those two groups would come together if there was some sort of nuclear crisis. But in the meantime, those groups are going to be splintered if there isn't a crisis because they all have their specific agenda. So it would be interesting to follow groups, you know, if you had a history of groups beforehand, uh, people who just joined Occupy and then dropped out, or people who joined Occupy and then got into other groups. That's all. Okay. I'll bet I don't keep the mic. <laughs> you don't. All right. Good stuff in the first instance, good talk, good discussion here. <coughs> 
like you, I've been a history dude. I've been a history dude for 50 years since Jack Kennedy was removed from office. All right? In his car. Yeah. 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 That's another way of doing it. That's right. Let's go. Uh, and there's all sorts of other stuff to say about that. But. I've been studying political culture ever since. I'm sort of a player in a certain niche in historical artifacts. And the two dudes who I studied more than any others over these 50 years were Jack Kennedy and Adolf Hitler. And you can throw Bobby Kennedy in too. Now, uh, those two dudes both ended up being, in their way, the apotheoses of what was conceived of at the time within the political culture as being what it meant to be human, all right? The, high, the highest, more or less, the Jack Kennedy was loved by millions of Americans. He was considered to be the highest possible human being by millions, and so was Hitler in his country. Now, the trouble is, is you, the people, when their bellies are full, they'll tend to flock toward dudes like Jack Kennedy. When their bellies ain't so full, they're gonna go a different direction, all right? And I'm predicting you, that in due course, probably in this decade, the bellies are going to get emptier and emptier. All right, the middle class is going down. It's being set up for 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 a, being their shoulders being low, some holes for their heads. All right, and when that happens, I only can think of one way to try to avoid some sort of Hitler type being put up by the industrialists, as Hitler sort of was. They lost control of them, but that was their idea, all right? And that is, if there is a cadre, if you will, of folks who manage somehow to get across to the middle class now, hey, folks, these are being set up for a fall. And we will be, our predictions about this stuff will be vindicated. And hopefully, we will survive. We will not be eliminated by Hitler's buddies, such that when the bellies are empty, that the folks will know that we exist. The folks will know how prescient we were. And the folks may, on that basis, turn to us rather than to the Hitler that these dudes, that the, that the big boys trot out. Now that's, you know, if, if you guys can think, you're going to have to somehow think strategically and try to anticipate steps ahead. In Hitler's case, every bone in his body told him that the Weimar Republic in the mid-20s, when, you know, folks were damn near burning hundred mark bills for the hell of it, okay, prosperity, right? Every instinct in his body told him that it was house <coughs> cards that was going down, all right? And that if he hung in there, and if he busted his butt organizing his stormtroopers, etc., that the day would come when the people would see and remember that he was predicting, hey, this house of cards is going down, and he was vindicated in the minds of the German people by subsequent events. And I'll wager you that had a hell of a lot to do with how many of them flocked to him. And so what you folks, I say, want to do is to get yourselves in some sort of position like that. Now, the media context is very different. How much time do I have left now? Um, actually, time's up, Jeff. Okay, fine. All right. Well, that's try to think strategically and try to think historically about something else besides that. working, just speak into it. Okay. My first comment really is I take issue with the idea that socialism doesn't include democracy because I remember the Socialist Party USA as Ron and maybe some other people in this room and the very definition is the, of socialism is the democratic, when the people run the industry democratically. It has to be democracy. So the old Soviet Union, not socialist, because there was no democracy. You know? um, and that's 
that's basically what I have to say about this. About um, Occupy, one of the, I think, strengths of Occupy is that it wasn't really, didn't have a program. It just was a movement and it gathered all kinds of people. I remember going down to one of my first occupying, uh, wherever they, they were in front of the bank, I can't remember, and expect, I went with a friend and we expected to see the usual suspects, uh, all the radicals that we see in every other demo, and it turns out we didn't recognize these people. These were people for the first time who were just inspired to say something. There was a woman there who had a sign saying, suburban housewife. <laughs> it was like a first time doing things. Uh, I think that was one of the, uh, the good things about Occupy, and not everything is meant to last forever. I think it lasted for as long as it did, and then, you know, move on to something else. It was democratic, in the, in the, but it, it lost, for some reason, it lost momentum, but it got a lot of people thinking, when I wear my uh, Occupy button, my 99 cent button, especially during that time, people were just, you know, they couldn't talk enough about it. just people you meet on the bus, and they weren't, you know, necessarily going to be radicals, but they started thinking about what this world is about, and that's what Occupy was about. Um, I kind of felt bad when it went away, but now I say, okay, it had its time, and that's it. Okay. <laughs> All right, yeah, I'm the sneak up. Let's thank Ted for a nice presentation. Thank you for the handout and the preparation. I'll be eclectic as usual. Um, first of all, a little lesson. Um, the term, the Democratic Socialists came out because there was a Socialist Party and they had some internal stuff. And yeah, then they wanted to be democratic. Yeah. So they just said that they were not like the other socialists, they were democratic, open. And there is a branch of socialists and the Fabian socialists that believe in a democratic legislative process for effective change. But that's a poli sci lesson. Well, okay, Occupy Wall Street. It's actually Occupy Wall Street. And if you look at the graphics, uh, where it began is the a statement, I, I guess, against the moneyed interest and the direction that they were taking the nation and the satisfaction. And the assembly had struck a certain identity among a great many people that they were, in fact, the 99%, and they didn't like what the 1% were doing. It caught thing. It, it was creative. It had certainly very creative aspects to it, a spontaneity, spontaneity, um, spontaneous, spontaneous presence. Um, it struck fear in the establishment. And still, I, I don't want to talk about the past sense, but when you're given an entity in a society that doesn't follow the rules, it strikes fear in those, in in the established structure. Uh, believe you me, it causes them um, a certain measure of discomfort and they're struck with fear. Uh, I don't know how many public hearings that I unduly was searched and attendance was restricted. Uh, and I finally discovered because they had gotten some inclination that Occupy was going to show up and disrupt what in the proceedings. Um, yeah, that is a positive thing. It gets them to think perhaps about what they're doing. Um, it's kind of, that's what I mean, they, these are troublemakers who are willing to go out there and, and it's not just talk about it, but actually cause some trouble. Uh, change can in fact normally be quite boring. I mean, you can join the independent voters of Illinois like I do and do lobbying and any number of these other organizations. And quite frankly, this is kind of tedious office kind of activities which don't have a lot of appeal. 
Yes, it is necessary. It's a process we have in place. I do it all the time. Lobbying, uh, it's not often the most exciting method. And I can see why it drives people away. I think the Occupy movement here suffered from a thing. There was a lot of reliance on this new technology, uh, the internet. And I simply, they didn't, perhaps because of its newness and novelty, they didn't quite have it quite refined and maybe should have relied on standard established <coughs> communications. And I think it would have had a, a much longer lifespan. It was a little bit too, I just didn't know if anything was going on anymore like that. Mm -hmm. In terms of, um, you now I, I said, you know, that change can be boring. And the most boring thing any organization, I can state, that it will adopt doing is conducting its proceedings according to Robert's rules of order. <laughs> I personally will not affiliate with any organization <laughs> who insists on doing this. I'm a federal bureaucrat. This is about enough to make me want to puke. <laughs> I'm getting ill just thinking about it point of order or something. That's not, that's not the inclination of the Occupy movement. I think there's some presence tonight. I think there's some light to the very concept and idea. Whether it takes the form of the organization you've outlined, who knows? It will. The College Complex is some sort of strange organization, which I don't know what it is, but it's been around. I think Occupy is around and still around and can be around for a long time as long as somebody says perhaps the emperor has no clothes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Okay, um, Joe, you know, there are a lot of us who are involved with Occupy and have a very positive experience. Uh, we were doing grassroots organizing before Occupy and we're still doing that afterwards. And, uh, you know, it's just a new name. So that happens to be an article in The Nation from July 22nd, 29th of 2013 that talks about the Chicago land area, how some of us have uh, moved on to other things. And I happen to have a copy, and anybody can read that afterwards. Um, it's a good article. Mass participation. This is what uh, I think about a lot. How do we wake the sleeping giant up in the United States of America? Approximately 30, 330 million to 300. 40 million people uh, at this time of crisis, Wall Street crisis, K Street crisis, surveillance industrial complex, military industrial complex, uh, prison industrial complex, fossil fuel industry, the list goes on of why we're in crisis. Uh, treason seems to be everywhere and systematic change in its peaceful and democratic form is our duty right now. We're not just talking about flaws or failures. We're talking about massive acts of known crime by our political, financial, and military leaders. Uh, so how do we end our fear to wake the sleeping giant up? Well, I think this is a very solid proposal tonight. Uh, we all have had a job, or we know someone who's had a job, who's had endless middle manager after middle manager after middle manager telling us what we already have far more experience and expertise at whatever area of the community we give our time and our energy and our contributions to. Uh, this eliminates that obstacle and puts us, yeah, in the driver's seat. So I think the car analogy actually works for me when you think of it as a very fully inclusive car. A very, very uh, uncompromising definition of mass participation. Um, yeah, we have a dangerously high percentage of the powers that be that are in endgame strategy. Uh, they are playing for keeps, and they've known for decades that things like Fukushima and Deepwater Horizon and the melting of the polar caps was coming, and they're preparing, and we saw during Occupy what their response is, the peaceful democratic protest. Uh, the boot on our neck when we have our signs and our voices and our solidarity and our songs and our unity. So we can see who the violent ones are and who the tyrants are. Uh, and I'm just very hopeful to be living at this time, you know, 
to spend more solidarity with the faith community, with the veterans community, with the student community, with the disability community, with the senior community, and with always the worker community. Because uh, I, I believe this is our true nature. We can do this. We did it during the anti-Vietnam War and the Civil Rights Movement, and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do something unprecedentedly beautiful. And that's why I'm really glad that uh, Ted gave his presentation tonight. And I look forward All to right. everybody working more together to that goal. All right. Tim, can you uh, can you time me? Yes, I'll time you for four yeah. minutes. Okay, okay. Let me know when uh, I've got one minute left. Okay. okay. Give me a second here. All right. Now, um, first of all, uh, first of all, I thought this was a very informative speech. I was very interested in attending tonight because um, because I used to be involved in Occupy Chicago myself. Now, I wasn't at the level of, of our speaker tonight, but I basically, in my case, I simply attended a few attended a few of the rallies. Uh, sat in at a few uh, general assemblies, um, and I was, um, now I had been involved in, in politics before, uh, and, but uh, I, was, uh, I was really excited about Occupy because, and, and the reason I was excited about it is that I saw this as, it seemed like a real spontaneous uprising of the people. I agree in principle with a lot of what people have been saying here tonight. Um, there's, uh, it seems to me that especially, um, you know, especially in the last four or five years that, that the United States has become less and less like a democracy and more and more like an oligarchy. That, that the corporations, no matter who the people vote for, since the politicians, I'd say the majority of both Democrats and Republicans, get their money from the same corporate uh, campaign donors and from the same kind of rich people. And so the politics, we don't, we don't argue over economic issues. We don't argue about foreign policy. Our arguments are reduced to whether, you know, to things like gay rights and abortion. And, um, and, and the other issues are off the table, as they say in Washington. And, and here I, I feel, here was a group that was addressing the economic issues, but not, not a right-wing group like, like the Tea Partiers who do talk about economics, but a leftist group. And, but then it, there's, it fell apart, and I was, I was disappointed with that. I did see problems, though. One, I attended some of the General Assemblies, and I thought it was very hard for them to make a decision because of the requirement of having a supermajority, and also the fact that anybody, even some, even some Joe Schmo like myself, could sit in. Now, I'm a member of Democracy for America, a group that used to meet at the Lincoln restaurant, like 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 college complexes, and they have a system where if you participate in group activities and attend meetings above a certain level, you uh, gain the right to vote. And uh, now, I I also noticed that I I, used, I went even went during this NATO summit. I went to the um, to the Occupy headquarters uh, on Cermak Road, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with the uh, with with Joffrey Stewart. The poet and radical activist. Oh, yes. Okay, yes. Uh, now he was outside of Occupy headquarters, handing out his uh, his literature, and a lot of people know he's very strongly anti-Israel to the point where some people would say that he's an anti-Semite. Okay, uh, a member of Occupy Chicago, a young girl, came out and, uh, and 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 told him he couldn't be there. He was on a public sidewalk, you understand, handing out leaflets, but she said he couldn't be there. And when he said he had the right to be there, she brought over some big tough guy from the. Um, from from the from the, who worked at the storage room to shoulder him off the road, and and here what I saw happening was this 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 white this young white girl you know who's got facial piercings and some and some big tough looking either white or Hispanic guy okay uh, Tim saying I have one minute shouldering <coughs> another black man off a public sidewalk, uh, and I said you know what things haven't really changed that much, <laughs> and and, uh, and I think. Uh, I think on that note, I will, um, I, I also just want to say that I think that majority rule without minority rights is the tyranny of the majority. You know, it's no better uh, than, you know, and, it's, and, it's, and if the majority is, 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 is oppressing a minority, it's, it's no better than if they're being oppressed by a dictator. And uh, as for the Russian Revolution happening suddenly, well, Lenin planned it. Planned his re there were two revolutions. There was the March Revolution and the October Revolution, and Lenin planned his revolution 
decades in advance, or at least more than 10 years in advance. The, the, the Marsh Revolution happened spontaneously. The other idea, I have to say that, you know, our speaker lamented the fact that, that the people don't have the power to start a nuclear war, and all that I can say, oh, thank God. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, now, it's uh, your turn now. Speaker gets the last word. Yeah, the speaker gets the last word. <laughs> Uh, oh, you can talk till 9 o'clock if you want to. Nah, he's only... Oh, come on, Tim. Have a heart. I only got 20 minutes of tape left. You all brought up so many questions. We're still going to be closer in 20 minutes. I couldn't possibly answer them all. There is a lot to think about with this topic of the kind of government that we have, the kind of government that we need. Uh, there are lots of variables. It's not going to be a simple thing by any means. Uh, it's going to be anything but a simple thing. Um, so uh, I'll just uh, look for a few points that I can hit uh, real uh, fast. Um, Syria. Okay. Um, I think it's questionable to begin with uh, that the people rising up uh, was the reason that the United States didn't attack Syria. But <clears throat> even granting that, uh, for the sake of argument, uh, people rose up against the uh, war on Iraq, okay. um, even before it started. Uh, it's not as if the U.S. went into Iraq and then people started uh, uh, complaining or protesting about it. Even before the dawn uh, uh, war started, millions of people were out, out, out on the street, ma making their views clear. There was no popular support for attacking Iraq. The whole thing was nonsense from the beginning, transparent nonsense that any uh, ha third grader could have seen. Uh, and we went ahead and killed uh, uh, approximately a million Iraqis, the United States of Israel. Uh, the U.S. is dropping bombs uh, drone, by drones in, in half a dozen countries right now. Uh, people have been you know, protesting that. People have been uh, uh, you know, showing their disapproval of that. In other words, uh, okay, if you have a child and a parent, you know, the parent is the rule, uh, every now and then the child will, uh, you know, uh, you know, tap on the parent's uh, butt or whatever and say, uh, Mommy, 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 you know, please don't do X, Y, or Z, or please do X, Y, and Z. And then the mother will relent and, okay, little kid, you know, this time I'll do what you, what you like. So people do have influence occasionally, but that does not mean that they have power in, a, in an institutional sense, in a decisive sense. Uh, we are going downhill fast on all kinds of fronts, um, environmental, uh, warmongering, uh, not to mention economic, uh, the middle class is going down, and we have no overall control. The, our rulers are not stupid enough to stamp their boot on our necks uh, every, every instant. Okay? The, Ron Emanuel plays a brilliant game. He'll say, okay, we're going to close uh, 25 uh, libraries, or we're going to cut back li uh, library hours. Uh, uh, from seven days a week to five days a week, uh, nine to five to you know noon to five, whatever. And then of course everybody says, you know, what the bleep are you talking about? We need our libraries. What are you talking about? Uh, what is government for if not to provide education for our children, whatever? Okay. Uh, so Ron Manuel said, oh, okay. Well, in that case, um, I'll open them back up on uh, Saturday mornings, um, and uh, I won't fire all the librarians, just half of them, or whatever. You know, whatever. He does that on everything. Have you noticed? Have you all noticed this? Every time he comes up with some dumbass proposal, uh, he, he, he plays this game. These guys are not idiots. Our rulers are intelligent people. Um, and we have to be, uh, we have to understand that they will use their power for their purposes in all kinds of ways. Um, so anyway, I'm, I guess I'm not in there. Um, <laughs> guns, okay. By the way, the college here, we can say the blue. Okay. Oh, <laughs> no. Oh, oh, no. Oh, Just oh, remember, oh, it's going out on YouTube. Uh, 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 no. Uh, okay. Guns. Take guns. Where is Gene Anderson when we need him? It's okay. Sorry. Let him speak. There's a lot of times if there's, let it, let it if there's a, a, a better issue for people to decide democratically than, than the issue of guns, that doesn't mean that uh, you know there's not going to be a, a, a lively pro-gun uh, uh, you know uh, position. But whatever, however difficult the issue is, uh, there's no, uh, if we have uh, a democratic core to us, there's no uh, other way that we can go about this than have a debate uh, gathered together and decide by majority rule. 
Um, the question of minority rights has come up uh, a number of times. Um, it's kind of like one or the other. Either you have, and, and again, it's not the majorities and minorities that uh, we're talking about here with, with um, this program of democracy are not demographic majorities. They're not Christians versus Muslims. You can get a room full of Christians and Muslims that will agree on a lot of things, and they'll disagree on a lot of things, not necessarily religious things. It's a different, di uh, we're, not, we're talking about a, a different dynamic. Um, you get people together in a room, um, and then they start to talk to each other, and they see each other as human beings. They don't necessarily see each other as, you know, that black guy there, that white guy there, that Christian there, that Jew. No, you, we're talking, they talk about the issues. And there's a free discussion of, of, uh, of the issues. And uh, people start to respect each other for what they say, not for what they look like. Uh, this is the dynamic of democracy, of, 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 of collective decision making. So we have to get away from uh, this question. Okay, uh, whites here in this country are the, still the majority, especially compared to any particular uh, minority, like let's say blacks. Does that mean that whites are going to uh, oppress blacks on, on, you know, on every issue because they're, they're whites and they're the majority and blacks are the minority? It has been the history of the United States. Yes. <laughs> in this last <laughs> century. No, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Let me, let me oh, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. That's cool. That's fine. That's, no, that's fine. Uh, let me answer that. The people that have ruled this country have not been white people. They've been white elites. They've been white rich people. Okay? I would, if, if you had ordinary white people in power, this country would be completely different. Uh, completely different because ordinary uh, uh, working class white people are not the assholes that these rich white people are. And so it's, a, it's quite different. And besides that, it's still, you have the dynamic of getting uh, white people, black people, green people, blue people in a, in a, together and deciding together and, and, decide, and looking at each other in, in each other's eyes and discussing things. <laughs> You're going to have a different dynamic than having people in, in this little room uh, in this building called Capitol Hill over there in Washington, uh, and then you have a line of lobbyists outside the door giving each of those people uh, a, a million dollars or a half, a, a, you know, a twenty million dollars or whatever. And then what do you think those people in that in, in Capitol Hill are going to do? They're going to do what those lobbyists, uh, those millionaires, tell them to do. They're not going to listen to ordinary white people. They're not going to listen to black people or blue people. Okay, so it's, we're talking about a completely different system, a different dynamic. Uh, again, more ranting. Um, sorry about that. Um, your point about order, you, we do need order. And a, a democratic system is an ordered system. It has a particular uh, 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 structure. Well, you do need structure. And, then you, and you also need professional bureaucrats, true. Professional uh, servants, uh, public servants. Um, democracy uh, is, is not contradictory to that. Well, the, the thing about democracy is that you have um, people uh, in control the, I mean, ordinary people in control. You have the citizenry in control, in, in uh, overall control. And then under them, under them you have bureaucrats who do the uh, things in the public interest um, as opposed to private interests. Um, I, I guess I have to look at this more carefully to uh, answer every point. Um, I, I guess I'll just end by saying that I, I thank you all for uh, listening and uh, thinking about these things and bringing up uh, excellent points and um, it was a, uh, I enjoyed this very much. It was a great discussion. Thank you.